Hello, hello everyone. This is your host, Akil Jabbar, and welcome to another episode of SaaS District. On today's episode, we'll be talking about how to validate and launch a successful product in the market. Today, we have our guest, Mike Watts, with us. Mike is an experienced entrepreneur who has six startup companies under his belt, including founding three consecutive multi-million dollar companies in the last 10 years. He has successful exits from three companies, including one for over $6 million, and he had a business partnership with Shark Tank, Shark Tank famous Damon John. Mike currently serves as a founder and CEO of Love Handle, which is a fast-growing American manufacturer of custom smartphone grips. Many of Mike's products have been featured on Good Morning America, QVC, HSN, the, the, Today, the Today Show, and sold through major retailers such as Walmart, CVS, Home Depot, Lowe's, Office Depot, and more. Finally, Mike is a regular keynote speaker uh, for Entrepreneur and Inventor Group, a guest professor at the Texas A&M University's Entrepreneur Program in College Station, a two-time winner of the Aggie 100 Award for Fastest Growing Companies, and has been listed on the Fortune 5000. So welcome, Mike. Uh, glad to have you on today's show. Yeah, thank you, Akil. Sorry for the super long <laughs> intro. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's awesome. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with you, um, maybe could you share a better background about, about yourself than maybe I did? Yeah, sure. You know, I'm uh, I'm really just a, your average guy that is uh, adept at taking risks and putting myself out there, willing to try new things. And I've done that long enough and worked hard enough at it that I've found some success. I've had plenty of failures, but uh, typically the bios only have the uh, the successes <laughs> listed. Um, you know, from there, it's uh, it's been, you know, I lived in corporate America for eight years. So a lot of people can identify I had my own uh, cubicle issued and, you know, lived uh, through the electric company in Houston, went through, you know, graduated college, then went the traditional way for a while. But then I realized that I was kind of up against this glass ceiling in, in corporate America. In fact, it was so structured there that it, I always felt like it was more of like a concrete ceiling. Uh, you really, you could see it clearly. So there was no really getting through it. And I, I always just wanted more. Um, and my wife bought me the rich dad, poor dad book from back in the year 2000 when our first son was born. And, and it really changed my mindset about how I was going to approach my income for the next uh, 20 years, as it were, and how I would go about trying to create something but rather than just living within an ecosystem that already existed. Right. So is that when you say you got started as an entrepreneur? And if so, what would you say is that moment that you felt that it was the right time to take that step from, you know, corporate America to, hey, I'm ready to take that leap and become an entrepreneur? Yeah, so I feel like I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. I think that a lot of people kind of can identify with that DNA and they're probably the type of audience that, that listens to this show. And, you know, I was the guy selling candy in middle school to make an extra buck and um, all the way through high school, I had a job. I always liked working and making money and having money in my pocket, but I was always had some sort of hustle was with mowing lawns. And then, uh, you know, once I got out of college, we started, uh, after I read that rich dad, poor dad book, my wife and I started attending home and garden shows, trade shows that were consumer shows, which don't exist as much these days, but people would show up and it was like a live as seen on TV event. You walk around, you look at all the stuff and you buy a few things. And I was the pitch guy there. I, we had, uh, you know, lights and a elevated uh, stool in the back and a microphone. And I would stop people and give them my amazing pitch and try to get them to stop and buy my stuff. And, you know, I happened to cycle through a lot of types of products, um, you know, most of them not proprietary. And so I kept running into the same frustrations. I felt like I would figure out the marketing angle, the pitch. And then the next show, somebody that has seen me doing that would show up at the same with the same product. They would find my supplier. And so that sort of got me focused on needing something that was uh, patented, something protectable. And the, I was doing all this while I had a full-time job, while we had our first child at home. My wife and I would travel on the weekends, spend every vacation day, six day working, doing these shows. And then uh, eventually there was one day of the show that I had scaled up. I had uh, four different booths in this show in Houston. And and I'm traveling between all my booths selling my products. And I had a team at that point. And I ran across this product called that would eventually become the Pivot Trim, which would be my first big idea. 
And the guy that invented it, uh, his name was Orlando, he was sitting there demonstrating it's an aftermarket weed eater head. So anybody that's ever cut their own grass knows that you've got to wind the line on yeah. and it's uh, terribly frustrating and it breaks off all the time and it just pull your hair out. It's, when we feel like, oh, here's a problem we can solve. And this guy had invented this head that would go on any trimmer and the lines won't break, it's super easy to load and it solved a real problem and he had patents. And so I felt like, well, now this is the time to do it. You know, so I sat down with him and we were the next weekend, they had another show in Houston. I invited him back. I put him right next to me. And I know this long story, but my boss comes in that first day, right when the show opens, I'm supposed to be at work that day. Yeah. And, but I'd got all my work done and I was there at the show and he walked in he took a picture of me and said, I've seen everything I need to see. I turned and looked at uh, Orlando that invented this trimmer head. And I was like, man, I think I just got fired. <laughs> and he goes, well, you better make a deal then. Right. You know, so at that point, it really solidified the fact that, okay, this is really going to happen. I'm really, am going to go full time as an entrepreneur. So mm -hmm. uh, that'll be one of the things that the advice pieces I give to people is don't, you know, don't go full tilt and just say, I'm going to go from A to Z all at one time, like find some steps in the middle that you can take do the side hustle before you do the full hustle, right. you know, and that transition is very, very valuable. But over the weekend, I had decided I was not going to have a job anymore. And my wife and I were comfortable with that. And then Monday, I just didn't go in. And then turns out my vice president calls and she's like, Hey, we really want to keep you. And how, what can we do? And I'm like, well, I thought I was fired. No, you're not fired. And they try to give me a raise to stay. And, but at that point I said, you know what, it feels right. I had enough money kind of coming in on the side that, it wasn't going to be as big of an impact to us financially. We already had these other businesses kind of running. And now I could take this idea that was protectable and try to take it to market. And so resigned, left behind a pension, a 401k plan, insurance, all the great things that come with, you know, the security of, uh, of corporate America. And we went at it full time. It took us about five years to really scale that business up. But at that point we were doing, you know, over $5 million in sales and then, the next year, our largest customer made us an offer we couldn't refuse, and we sold the company for a pretty solid exit. And then I've started two since then, but that day was really a turning point for me. It would have been very easy to say, no, they're giving me more money. This is more security. I'm going to take that path. Or I took the riskier path, which for me felt more natural, and, and it felt like if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. So, Would you feel that was more risky, you know, looking back, would you have done it again knowing that, you know, you probably didn't know where you would be going at that stage that you would, you know, get to that 5 million stage in terms of where, you know, versus, you know, taking that comfortable job. Was, was there, uh, did you kind of run that calculation in your mind of like, I know that I just knew I'm going to figure this out or was it like, I have to figure it out and I'll figure it out as I kind of go and I have enough time to figure it out? Yeah, I felt some security in the fact that I had these other businesses that were operating. I had some wholesale customers for the commodity items. And, you know, and I had sort of a system in place that could generate some amount of money. It wasn't as much as I was making. Right. Um, but I felt like if I just didn't go for it, that I wouldn't ever have a chance at the upside. And it just frustrated me. This I, I was the weird guy that would go in, like everyone else got direct deposit. Mm -hmm. I would literally take, make them deliver me a check. I would go to the bank, which was in the building, cash the entire thing, hold it in my hand and walk around the bank lobby for a little while take a couple hundreds off, put it in my pocket and then go redeposit it. I needed that sort of uh, affirmation or that reinforcement for the amount of work that I did for the amount of money that I was getting. And so I felt like that if I could find a way to scale my time to, to actually be compensated, what I felt like I was offering uh, better and more appropriately, that that would be a better thing. So makes sense. So it was more about like missing out on, you know, what that opportunity that this was the time to do it versus that it was what you knew for sure what would happen, right? That's right. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of just switching gears in terms of like recent events uh, with, you know, obviously the COVID-19 virus and, you know, manufacturing, importing, export. I, I don't know how much of your products come you know, outside of the country, but just in general, how, how has sourcing or manufacturing of your products been affected recently? Well, we've been blessed because uh, around... So we started the Love Handle Company, which is, if anybody doesn't know, here we've got a little, yeah, it's just this simple little product that uh, sticks on the back of a smartphone and allows you to hold your phone with one finger, flip it around the back, super easy, right? Yeah. Simple idea, but you know, we first started the way I had started my other companies by making it in China. 
That's what you do, right? You take your product, make it in China. Well, just like I had problems with my other companies with quality, I had the same thing here. But the problem was that I got so full of myself that I, I knew this product was going to be great. I had just sold millions of, you know, my previous product. And so I ordered around a half a million dollars worth of product in from China my first time. Wow. Uh, and what happened is they had cut corners on the glue, which holds the whole thing together with a cheaper glue, not telling me. And so I ended up, they started falling apart. And so I ended up having to throw away half a million dollars worth of product in the dump. And it's not Walmart. You can't go back to customer service and stand in line with your receipt and get your <laughs> refund. It just doesn't work that way, right? Right. Um, so we started on that day to find a way to reshore our product. And so we've developed our own automation equipment to build our product here in Texas. And uh, we source all of our components strictly in the U.S., even though it costs us double in some cases to buy it domestically, all before COVID. And so now that this has happened, um, we've had zero interruption with our supply chain. Uh, and our only interruption is our ability to keep our workers spread apart safely enough to, to operate, which uh, we've been able to adapt to. Uh, and so, you know, some of our elastic suppliers are getting worked over pretty good for, for some things that they make that are getting heavily used right now. But that said, we've got a long enough relationship with them that, that our supply has, doesn't seem to be interrupted. And so for us, it's been a very uh, seamless transition. And I can only imagine a world in which I was now relying on China right. who's going to, you know, where, I don't know where this goes, right? It seems very combative right now. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know where this trade ends up, but it feels like a very safe position to be in, to be domestically making our products. And going forward, I think that it will be even more important for at least American consumers to have 100% made in America products. Makes sense. Yeah, I know how difficult finding a reliable supplier can be. I know when I when I started e-commerce business a, a couple of years ago, um, I think I ordered one from China, one from Pakistan, and one from I can't remember somewhere else. But I, I know that every single one had you know something, whether it was quality, whether it was like the deliver you know delivery of it. Um, right. you know, just, uh, you know, inconsistency in the product of, you know, this shipment versus the next, if someone is looking to find a re reliable supplier, whether it's, you know, locally in the U S or wherever they mm -hmm. are, yeah. um, or going externally, what steps do you suggest for kind of filtering for a good supplier? Cause I think that sets you up really for the rest of it. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Having a supplier, it's, it's like anything. I mean, you really treat it more like you would a marriage, um, or at least a serious date, uh, because, you know, you don't want to just take the first one, right? You, you want, this is going to be, it's a give and take and you don't want to be walking in just, you know, saying that price is everything because it's not everything. Uh, price is important, but um, you know, reliability, quality, um, adaptability, you know, creativity and ingenuity um, is super important. And so what I always do is I try to build a relationship first with the supplier and get comfortable that we share the same value set then I, you know they obviously we're going to ask them to see well what is your you know quality control protocols how do you show us another job and how do you go ensure quality is there because quality is one of those things that you can you can give up on a lot of things but quality is one of those pieces that if you compromise on quality it's it could it could be critical for your business and, and fatal for your business so uh, you want to make sure that they have the ability and knowledge and procedures in order to create quality products not just once but consistently over time. And that said, they need to know that you have systems on your side to keep them accountable, right? So when you receive a shipment, you don't just take it and go stick it on the shelf. Everything comes in and it has a procedure for, okay, we're gonna check the tolerances here, we're gonna check the flatness, we're gonna check the color and make sure that everything's right. And then we're gonna let them know, hey, we checked it, this checked out, good, thank you, right? And so there's this two-way cycle where you're constantly communicating uh, about your supply chain and so that everybody can make corrections as needed, if needed. Um, so those are some tips. What would you say that went wrong with that last, uh, that shipment where you spent, you know, half a million dollars in that glue issue that you had? Would you, you know, what were the learnings there? Well, for me, it was, I wasn't specific enough about what I wanted and expected. Um, I said we wanted to use certain brand of glue not that I needed, wanted to use a certain brand, but also a certain specific um, style of glue that they made. Well, that was the style I was wanting was the most expensive one they make. Mm -hmm. And 
the one they chose was the cheapest one they made. So they took the limitation I gave them, worked within that, but then pushed it to the bottom common <laughs> denominator, right? right? Versus maybe a different supplier might have done the opposite and said, you know, hey, we, our standard is here. We're always going to choose the best quality for the, or would have communicated back to me that, hey, we're going to make this change. But that's been my experience with the Chinese. Um, I have great Chinese friends. I've made millions of products in China, most of them very good. Mm -hmm. But left to their own devices, if you give them a choice about components or processes or how to test things, then they're going to choose a lower denominator because they could be more efficient. And that's in their mindset seems to be the most important thing because then they could be cheaper. Right. And that's what everything is. It's all about the lowest price in the world. So you, if you do make products overseas or in a place that you can't walk into, then you need to be very, very specific, like that a two year old could pick it up, mm. you know, and understand or second grader could pick it up and understand like what it is that you're making, how it's made and how you determine, is it a pass or is it a fail? And if you don't set those procedures up in advance and just say, hey, make this and make it good, then you're almost guaranteed to find some failures down the road. Do you think uh, things would have changed for you in terms of you know, how you now uh, source your product internally in the U.S.? If, say, you, you sourced a lower volume amount of, of, uh, of those, you know, that, that product versus you, know, you spent half a million dollars and then you find yeah. out, like, do you think that would have been a different? It might have been. It might have been less painful such that I could have reacted and said, okay, well, for the next round, then you do it this way and sort of learn my lesson. But I had been through that before. We had had another product launch that cost me $400,000. Okay. <laughs> uh, when we launched a product into Lowe's and they had cheapened up some plastics and the product was breaking apart. You know, weed eater heads when they're spinning around 12,000 RPMs, you can't compromise on that quality. Right. And so the, it, it had been the second time, kind of burn me once, burn me twice, don't, not gonna happen again even though I had no idea how we were actually going to be able to make it here in the U S mm -hmm. I just, we just collectively had this drive to say, we're going to figure this out and figure out how to do it. And it took, took a lot of time and effort and money to get yeah. there, but it's a nice spot to be. Well worth it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I know you also help and mentor a lot of others uh, who are looking to start their own business. Um, obviously odds are against you when starting a new business, just, you know, probability of uh, new businesses and failure. Um, what journey or path do you suggest they take on increasing their, their odds of success if, other than, you know, su maybe, you know, suppliers, one of them, what else are some exercises people can do to, to help them? Well, I think that people need to understand the value that they're bringing to the world first, right? There's a lot of details around supply, making products and supply chain and packaging and, and but, Ultimately, you need to be sure that you're bringing a sufficient amount of value to the world, that the world's going to pay you for it in, in high enough denominations to make it worth the money, the risk, the time, and everything that you're going to have to invest into it to get it up off the ground. So I think it's extreme because so many people come to me with an invention, right? Because I'm kind of been a product guy and they're like, hey, I have this idea for and, you know, whatever, like everybody has an idea, which is awesome. And that's great. And that's what, you know, entrepreneurship's all about. But a lot of times it, it kind of doesn't even really solve a problem, a big of enough problem that you're like, well, okay. Like the other day, somebody was showing me something around making it easier to hold your shoes tied, but you still have to tie your shoe on top of it. Just a little keeper. Right. And I was like, okay, now I'm going to try to have to go out to the world and say, Hey, you know, that, problem you have with tying your shoes? No, I don't. <laughs> right. Right. You want people to be able to at least understand the problem that you're trying to address. Mm. Now I can say, Oh, look, another time you dropped your phone on your face yesterday when you were laying on the couch. Oh yeah. Well now I got something better for you. Or the time you had to press your screen. Now you've elicited an emotional response and that dictates that there's a market there. Right. So first and foremost, be sure you're delivering enough value with your idea, your product, your service, such that the world will want it naturally without you having to teach them about wanting it because the education is the expensive part. And then on top of that, you, we talked about it earlier, but the quality has to be there. You have to have the, and, and I'm not talking about complex quality. A lot of inventors will come to me with an idea and it's so complex, it does the job but it's going to be hard to make and it's hard to 
to package or whatever. Like you need the lowest, like it's like making syrup, you know, you got to boil it down, boil it down, boil it down. What's the, the least common denominator, the you know, minimum viable product you'll hear a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Launch that and only that and don't get distracted by you could do this and you could do that. And if you, if you do that, you're going to be doing nothing. So you got to stay laser focused on something that you think delivers value and stay with it. Now be willing to adapt to the market. If the market says, Hey, you need to make this change to it. And you, you start hearing that a lot. We'll make the change. You know, it's, I'm guarantee you the product's not going to look exactly the way you think at the end than when you start. But that said, don't chase the rabbit. Like along the way, I made a few mistakes. I said, okay, well, I want to get, I'm in this phone grip game. That means I'm a phone accessory company. I'm going to be in backup batteries. Mm. So I bought a whole bunch of backup batteries, brought those in. Well, next thing you know, I'm back in the commodity business. And it's all about pennies and quality. And next thing, again, they're dying and they're not holding the charge. And I'm finding myself chasing all these problems. And what am I doing? I'm not paying attention to my main product. Mm. I'm not spending my time and effort on launching this one idea that is novel and is innovative into the market and making sure people understand the value that it brings because I'm off chasing squirrels. So would you suggest just focusing on one product? So if you have you know, a choice between a couple, just start with the one, or would you go and test like five different items at the same time? Testing is different, right? So if you're trying to choose among five different ideas you have, Yep. then that's fine. Uh, for me personally, I say pick one and stick with the one. You can always expand, but you have to break through. So the, the cycle that has worked for me is to take one great item, use it to build a brand. And then once you have a brand, then your consumers and the retailers are going to say, that's great. That's selling fantastic. What else do you got? I got one of those emails yesterday from Academy Sports and Outdoors or about a 300 store chain here in the Southern U S and a sporting goods store. And we launched our product right actually right before COVID they were selling great. COVID came, you know, like not as many people in the stores, but now people are starting to come back to stores and our sales are actually trending up pretty dramatically, even during all this. I say all that to say that because of that, because of the data associated with a good product and good packaging at the right store, they're saying, what did their email say? It said, what else do you got? I see you have, oh, I looked at your website. You have a larger one for, for tablets and laptops. What else could we use that on? Could you use it on an ammo box? Could you use it on, you know, different types of things? Like, would it be useful on a golf cart? Like all these different applications that are, they're now trying to say, how can you as this credible developer of, of great products that we can make money on, what else you got in your tool belt? So that's the point where you roll out this and that and this and that, and they don't even have to be as good. Right because you've established the brand and then now you can kind of cash in on it. But if you come at them with too many products at once, they don't know who you are. Right. So prove yourself once, you know, you're kind of in a test phase where they're, they're trying to, you know, see how the relationship goes. You can prove that you can handle one product. Now you've kind of opened up the doors for everything after that. Kind of. That's right. Yeah. Yeti is a perfect example of that. You know, those guys also, I don't know if you guys have Yeti, but it's a, it's a brand. They started with the, an ice chest that was a bear proof ice chest. Bears couldn't get into it, right? It's super tough, but it'll hold ice even in Texas heat for like a week. You could put a bag of ice in there a week later, still got ice in it outside. And they started with that. And now they make tumblers and shirts and, you know, oh, they have hundreds of products, but they started with one great thing, built a brand and then branched out. Makes sense. Yeah, I can see that similar with uh, SaaS. I know it's a little bit different than product, but with software, when you're looking at a product, you don't, you know, you don't want something that does like an all in one until you've kind of, they've proven that, you know, they've been really, really good at one, you know, functionality, one feature, you know, get that really feature really well for my specific case. And then you start adding more things. I'm like, okay, you know, we'll start playing with that and we'll right. see if I like it. Makes sense. Um, side note, I'd love to hear the story on how you partnered with Damon John, obviously from Shark Tank. He's a, he's a celebrity. I've actually read his book is actually really surprisingly good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm uh, curious how, how that went and how, how you ended up with him working with him. Right. Yeah. Not teasing. Him. I'm like, man, I, who knew you were actually a, a decent writer? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. but he is, his books are great. Anybody out there, um, his, yeah, he's got some great content, but it's funny, you know, Shark Tank is a phenomenon here in the U S right. And it's won all these Emmys and everything. But when it first came out, it really spoke to me. Like I said, this is, this is my people, right? The idea that you can, 
go on television and present your business idea to a group of people with millions of dollars and the ability to help you and all this business knowledge and and that they'll right there in front of you in one moment you can go from an unknown brand to all of a sudden you've been on tv and you've got this financial backing and this great mentor and resource i said i'm going to get on this show i'm going to do it and so we me and my family we would watch every episode and we said we'd pause it and we'd be like okay so is they going to get a deal or not get a deal and why would they get a deal and why wouldn't they get a deal so we would create good family time conversations but then i would stand up and give my pitch for my product and i had it down man i had it nailed and so we uh my dad and i we auditioned he's my partner here we auditioned in las vegas right after the uh consumer electronics show the big ces show in vegas they had an open call casting event there and so we went and uh, got in line at 4 a.m to get us a wristband and we went and pitched the producers and uh, got through they loved it they got us through to the second round and so then we're in with the producers again with this uh, second round of pitches and then for whatever reason it didn't make it through we didn't make it on the show oh, wow. so i was really heartbroken like i was like man I, was, I knew this is what i wanted to do and i knew that damon would have been my target shark that i wanted to do a deal with because i just respected him i'd read his books like you and knew that he was just a guy that really could help me and i've kind of identified and he likes to fish like i do too so <laughs> anyway the year goes by we we're at the show again the next year. Like, let's try it again. So we went again. We got through the first round, made it to the second round. We're like, this is it. Finally going to do it. Some of the producers even had my product on their phone. I'm like, okay, well, this is a sign. And then we got the call. You didn't make it one more time. I was like, man, what is going on? Like, why are they not putting me on the show? What is it about my product or me or that's going on? Well, I always tell people, like, the best plan is not the one that you can see right there's some better plan that god has provided for you and you just have to be able to be willing to look for it around what you so i was so focused on doing a deal with damon on shark tank that that night right after we had gotten um, turned down again i was on my website looking through orders on my own website and i see an order from the shark group hmm. i was like what's that looked it up sure enough that's damon john's company in New York City, he's a branding company. They're ordering products from my website. I was like, wow, that is cool. And so immediately I pick up the phone, there's a phone number on there. I was like, called and I'm like, uh, yeah, is Damon John there? And, and they're like, no, uh, who, who, how can I help you? And I was like, hey, you guys just placed an order on my website. I'm just a big fan. And they're like, oh, well, you can't talk to Damon, but um, built a relationship with his kind of gatekeeper there. And next thing you know, I'm sending product. I'm, putting power of broke, printing them on these phone grips and sending them to his office for every book release he does. I'm sending them some product, shark group branding, sending them. And I get everyone in the building using my product, loving the product. And then one day the phone rings and Damon and his team are calling saying, look, we love your hustle. We love your product. Everybody here is a big fan of you and of, uh, of your product. Maybe we can work something out. And so, we worked and we kind of negotiated back and forth over several months and then made a deal. And so I was able to make a deal and the only deal he ever did that way. Wow. So we made a deal with a shark, a dream shark without ever going on the tank. Well, I take that back. I'm going on the tank, but I'll be backstage when they do filming next month. So nice. I'm making it on the tank, but not the way I originally thought. And that's how I did a deal with Damon John. And now he's a trusted friend and mentor and really helps kind of guide us and make sure to, seed our product as he goes and show it off and so it's really been a win-win for us for sure and that was for for love handle now that's he's, he's uh -huh, pretty yeah. okay and how, how would you define his uh his value and contribution or is it still too early in terms of like the success or growth of uh love handle at this point well i'll put it this way the deal we made was for him to earn his way into the company mm. by increasing our sales you know people always say well how much are you going to give me Say, well, how much, I, I always flip that and say, how much can we do together, right? So instead of saying, hey, let's, how much are we going to split this pie up and I'm going to get this half and you get this half, we said, let's just make the pie bigger and then we'll talk about splitting it up. Okay. And so he said, okay, well, how about I can double your sales in 24 months by just by things I do? Okay. I said, okay, well, he puts me on Good Morning America, puts me on Today Show, QVC, um, and then now he got us an academy and we got that meeting set up with his team. 
And it took him about six months to double my sales. Earned his way in, so double the pie, he gets a small piece. There we go, right? So it was a kind of a creative solution. And yes, he's, that was the immediate value. But since then, you know, he's handed these things to the Kardashians. He's given them to, you know, President or former President Obama. Like he is very, very connected and is constantly passing my product out because he believes in it and he's a kind of has some ownership. So, and he's been a huge value just to reach out to and say, Hey, I need this contact. Can you help me get to this person? The buyer at Walmart, the buyer at Target, whatever, CVS, no problem. You know, he knows. Them. That's huge. So just, I mean, having a mentor like that, right? Just now six months, double your company. That's, yeah, if, if everybody yeah. could get that, I mean, that's all you need, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah you know, they yeah, talk yeah. about it on that show all the time. Yeah, like yeah. the value of the shark is not just an investor. I mean, anybody can write a check. That's right. But, you know, that's not what you need. You need somebody that's a strategic investor. And these guys are the best at that. Right. So mostly on, you'd say is like the, their network is really what they bring, I think, mm-hmm. and just what they know. It makes sense. Yeah. It kind of dates him, but he always talks about his Rolodex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. So I, I know like, from you know people a lot of people i speak to i'm sure you hear it a lot they get stuck on finding that idea so i know whether it's you know they want to build it themselves or just you know starting their, they want to launch a business side mm-hmm. hustle or, or whatnot what are some steps to overcome finding that you know perfect quote unquote idea i'd say i always you know and, and right now is a great time i yeah. think that there's going to be a boom in side hustles because everybody's sitting at home they may be getting paid not may not be getting paid Right. right. But they're trying to find some way to, to bring something to the table. Um, so that said, I always basically start with education. Okay. You need to understand some market if you, you know, cause you're addressing ultimately, at least in my experience with a product, physical product or a service-based product, either one, you're addressing some sort of need. Is it marketing? Is it somebody needs marketing help or they need, so then you need to become an expert in what are the real pain points? that people have in that space that you're going after. You might be having an invention for firefighters to make them do their job better. Well, you, then you need to go interview firefighters and talk to firefighters and listen to watch YouTube channels about firefighters and like understand that space, not just say, Hey, I was able to take this chewing gum and this driver's license and I made this cool thing that does this. Well, great. Well, who wants that and why do they want it? And then how, what's your messaging going to be like to get them to understand how, their problem is now solved by your product. And you need to understand that all before you really start. And I also tell people the biggest thing is to start, take affordable steps. And Damon, I stole this straight from Damon. He talks about this all the time. Take affordable steps. Don't try to say, I have this idea, so I need to go raise a million dollars, right? And go re- rent an office and you know, hire a secretary and an accountant and a marketing person and a salesperson all before they ever, ever proven anything works. Like prove the idea first with that minimum viable product, get people to buy it. Even if you don't have it, go create an ad, put it on Instagram and see if people will place an order, refund their money and say, Oh, sorry, this is on back order now, but that's a cheap way to figure out if somebody will actually buy something before you even have spent the time and effort to develop it. Right. So, and be willing to, to change it and get their feedback and try new things and, and adapt. But if you keep at that, I think that it's practically guaranteed that you'll find something that'll work. I and mean, then especially this explosive e-commerce space that's coming up now, like that's where I would be trying to innovate in for sure. Exactly. I think uh, it's Tim Ferriss, right? In for our work week who talks about that, that, uh, that method, right? Of just throwing up a landing page and, you know, seeing if it converts on, you know, using Google AdWords or whatnot, right? Or in yep, this case, Instagram right. ads. So when do you know it's the right, like what validation are you looking for or feedback, whether there's going to be a demand and that you should kind of double down on this product when launching. So for example, like, you know, the, the, for the love handle, was there some kind of a message or, or KPI that you, you, you received that said, okay, this is a winning product. I need to you know, double down and work on this. Yeah. Reorders for me. Um, when we were able to get a sale, typically they'd be small early on. Um, but when a reorder would come in two weeks later for double the amount, it, that's ultimately what you're looking for is that, is that reorder? Because if you can, at least in our business, because you know, that means that you delivered on that value, mm-hmm. that you delivered more value than the value that they gave you in money. Right. And so that's why they're coming back and doubling down because it's essentially a profit center for them in some, 
intrinsic value way. So I think it's really important that you, you look for some indicator like that, not just sales, um, but reorders and repeat business and positive feedback. I kind of put like five-star review would also be in the same thing as a reorder. Like those, those affirmations is what you're looking for to say, okay, yeah, this is working. Let's push more in this direction. But if a lot of people are saying, Hey, you know, for whatever reason, this thing's too thick, it, you know, it's stuck in my pocket. It doesn't, it blocks my wireless charger. Well, then we might should stop and then make it thinner. Right. And make it a little more pocket friendly and, and then to try, like, you want to make sure you, before you go big, that you've got, you know, I think a, your best version, at least your best version currently of the product to push out and really put some dollars behind. Yeah, I guess refunds would be would be another big one as well, right? See how if people refunding, complaining. Right, exactly. Yeah, that would be the antithesis of that. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, and what would you say, like some of the biggest challenges you had, you know, six different companies you've started, you know, can you name some, uh, you know, big challenges that maybe other people can learn from or, or lessons? Uh, um, yeah, that it's going to take more time, more money, um, and you're going to work a lot harder than you've ever worked. If you just want to work less and kind of ride the smooth trail, then you should probably just stick with the nine to five W2 type of income. Makes sense. But if, if you want that big upside, if you really want the big upside, then you're going to need to, you know, nope, it doesn't just happen. Any of those sharks sitting on that shark tank, they didn't find success and I mean, success didn't find them. They went and found it and discovered it and worked for it and earned it. So just know that there's a lot of work involved. And the best thing you can do is to love the process. If you don't love being in the game, if you something about it, it just, it's just too scary for you or too much risk, or then maybe that's just not right for you. Not everyone can be an entrepreneur in the, in the, in the, I mean, everybody is in some ways, everybody's personal brand. And whether they like it or not, they're an entrepreneur. They're their own brand. But I'm saying start a company that you expect to be a multi-million dollar company with however many dozens or hundreds of employees, then you're going to need the fortitude to know that you're going to have tons of failure that's going to come your way. And that's normal. That's expected. Failure is, an, is a, just an affirmation that you're doing something. Right. And it's how you react and respond to that failure. How do you overcome it um, when it happens? And will you learn from it? And how quickly do you learn from it and adapt and move forward and recover? That's the, that's the ultimate, that's what everything comes down to for success in this thing is how quickly do you take an obstacle, work through it, find a path and stick with your choice and then move forward again. And, and speaking about time, um, just to add to that. So, you know, maybe you only, you said you're, you're uh, investing a small amount, you're losing, let's say a thousand dollars. You buy this product, you launch some ad campaigns, now you're waiting for that that feedback, which is the reviews or the the positive, uh, sorry, the uh, the reorders. Mm -hmm. How long are you waiting before you say this is a, a dead product, or I'm I'm going to continue? Like I think you know, valuing your time and, and you know, going double down on this product versus okay, let's scrap it and move on. Um, what's what's your approach around that? I guess it's, if that's a personal question for each. You know, if you have the bandwidth to maybe launch four or five test ideas at a time i think that's perfectly fine mm -hmm. until you if you're using that as a mechanism to search for a winner mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but so rare is it that people do that normally they find one thing they personally identify with it being their idea or their mission to take this thing to market, and then they'll stay narrowly focused on that before ever proving it out and so that's why i talk about this testing ideas a lot um, I would say that, you know, if you're not getting in this modern age, you know, if you're finding your right market and they're not responding to it, mm -hmm. that's a really big signal that probably they don't want it. Um, right now is the easiest time I think in the world to, to try to get to a customer and get in front of the right specific customer. And with video, particularly if you have a short video and you need, that's another big thing. Like if your idea can't be demonstrated, mm -hmm with some sort of 15 to 30 second video, then you're gonna have a lot harder time selling it today. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the new infomercial is, you know, the, the you're everybody swiping really quick. Yeah. You, know, you gotta get their attention, show them, oh, that's, well, that's interesting. I can stick my phone to where? Oh, that, that would be handy to have. Let me click here and see more, right? right. So even if you don't have the product developed, if you can kind of show how it would work, put some ads up and just see what, what people's reaction is like, then I think that, uh, you can tell something from that. 
And how do you deal with somebody, you know, coming and copying your product or, or your business? I'm sure you see it a lot with, you know, something on your you know, love handle. I'm sure there's a lot right. of people who, who come in and now they're competing with you. How do you, how do you typically deal with that? Well, you, you know, and it depends on which, you know, what country you're in and, and the intellectual property laws and things like that. Being first to market is really important. Okay. You got to be first, right? So um, to your previous question, you can't wait too long, test it long enough that somebody goes, oh, that is a good idea. I think I'll do it, you know, and then beat you around the corner. Uh, and that's going to happen some. Sometimes you're going to get beat. But if it's something that has some intellectual property tied to it, a patent, um, copyright, uh, I think that that's really important in the long term, right? So all my products have been licensed intellectual property. So what I do is I go find an inventor. Most inventors are a certain personality type, mostly, right? They like to tinker, they like to, to build and create and innovate. They're not necessarily a person that wants to sit on the phone or do a podcast interview, right? Uh, that's just not their game. Me, on the other hand, I like to talk, I'm a marketer, I love to sell, I love to be out in the trenches. And so that marriage of those two is a very good fit, right? Because they can go back to the workshop and I can go sell their idea and they can work on the next idea. And so this licensing structure has worked very well for me because everybody's in their sweet spot. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's really worked out good like that. So I, I would just say that make sure that you're in your, in your zone and that you're, you know, again, delivering the value to the consumer so that they, and understand what it is that you're doing for that. Right. It's very, very, very similar to a software startup. We see the exact same thing. Usually the best businesses we find are where there's complementary co-founders. One is, you know, business, biz dev. Other one is, uh, you know, product. Two, they're focusing like a CTO who's developing the product. The other one yep. just can go out and, and focus it. But, you know, say, same with us. When we're looking at acquisitions for businesses, uh, typically we're finding people are really good at product. They've done a really good job of creating a certain product, but they just... They'd rather just be in that zone of just keep creating features and features and making it better and better. And like when you ask them about marketing or sales, they're just like, you know, make some excuse why they don't want to market it. But it's so obvious that it's such a great product that they, somebody needs to get this out there. But it's just they, they don't feel comfortable doing it. So that's where we come and say, OK, well, you keep focusing on focusing on this. We'll take care of the marketing and growth and you know, let's, let's grow this together. So, yeah. Um, so last question from our side. Um, hypothetical you have you know we kind of chat about this a bit but you have a thousand dollars exactly to validate a new business what is the best way to get started with you know whether it's manufacturing your product or your idea and you don't have a a, a big partner like daemond or like deep pockets otherwise right what do you right do you, how do you go through that well not to beat a dead horse but i think that what i had said was you know to make make one you know something you can demonstrate and this might be with a if it's a physical product right let's just take, assume for a moment that it is a physical product. See if you can make a prototype, something that can be shown. And if you can't physically make one, make a rendering of it, right? And even if it's just for yourself, use those resources to create something that demonstrates your product, right? Visually demonstrates it, whether it's a, just an in-person video you made with your phone or it's a visual rendering or whatever. And then spend some dollars and putting it on a few different social media channels and see what kind of engagement you get. Um, the alternative or supplemental piece to that is it's very inexpensive to start a Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign. And it's essentially doing the same thing that what we're talking about. You're proving a model for an idea to see if you can get people. And the great thing about those is you can raise money without ever giving up any piece of your company, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and then get feedback and develop to continue developing your product. So, you have an idea and it's a thousand dollars and I think it's a good, nice limiting budget, right? It's a small amount of money uh, in the bigger scheme of things and starting a company, but you can do some of those things and bootstrap your way through it. And if you can demonstrate it, then you're going to know very quickly, should you go get some more money or find some more money to keep working on it? Uh, there's no shame either. in just taking the thousand and say, okay, well, I'm going to just, I'm going to keep at this until I can turn it into 2000, right? How do I go about, making a few of these and selling those and then taking pre-orders or whatever and get to 2000 prove to yourself that it can be a profit center and not a hobby. Cause so many people try to take a hobby, turn it into a business, end up cashing their 401k in and all their life savings and pushing it towards this dream of an idea that never really had hope. It should have just made one for themselves. Right. Not necessarily what the market wants. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. 
Thank you so much, Mike. That was uh, actually really, really helpful. Um, thank you for joining us today. Where, where can uh, people know more about you if they want to get in touch with you or, or follow you? Yeah, great. Uh, so I'm on Instagram a lot. I'm at Mike Watts on Instagram and uh, I'm on LinkedIn too. I'm going to be starting a live LinkedIn show there this cool. summer. So really excited about that where we try to teach entrepreneurship. So just look for Mike Watson. I'll be out there and about. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. We'll, we'll get Thanks. this out to our audience. Okay, great. Thanks, Akil. <laughs> Take care. Thank you all for listening in to today's episode. Don't forget to join us for another episode where we interview top leaders and experts in the business and SaaS industry. If you enjoyed this episode, I ask that you please give us a five-star review on iTunes. That would be really, really appreciated. Otherwise, if you have any feedback, suggestions, or improvements for this podcast, please feel free to send it directly to me on our website at horizoncapital.com or you can just tweet me at Akil Jabbar. Thanks again and hope to see you guys on the next episode.